Check, check. Six through uh, eleven or twelve or so, he talks about the fact that there's only 
Hello, Kevin. Looks like the Nancys are in town. Good to see y'all. We're in the book of Galatians, verses 6 through 11 or 12. Paul talks about the fact that there's only one gospel. And he marveled, he was astonished, or he was just blown away by the fact that these Galatians were in the process of moving away from this one gospel and turning to a different gospel. And he announces a curse two different times on them uh, if, if they should continue in the path that they were. And he, he's going to make the point here this morning in our lesson text that he, he received his revelation from God, his apostleship from God directly. And so he didn't get it from man. And so there's no way that man could like collude and, and come together and, and come up with another gospel because he just didn't see anybody. You know, he, he went off for 30 years on his own and it mentions he had a brief meeting with, with Cephas and, and, and some of the other apostles and went to Jerusalem at one point, but he just really didn't see anybody where he could get together and collude or, or come up with another gospel. And so he makes the point that there's only one gospel, and we talked about that last week, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, there's one church, and so forth. So if you will, let's look at verses 13 through 14 this morning, starting off. And Paul writes, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. So we know the background of Paul, and we're going to look at that. I, I'm going to submit to you during the course of this lesson that Paul was the ideal candidate to be converted or to, to, uh, to follow this new life for Jesus Christ. And I make that statement because he was so zealous for the ways of the, of the Jews and for his, his fathers. He was so gung-ho about it and just so, so into it that when he finally did, was converted there on the road to, to Damascus, he, he, he brought that same zeal and enthusiasm with him that he had formerly used to persecute the way. He now used that same zeal and enthusiasm to become, you know, a, a writer of however many Gospels he wrote and and uh, a missionary, and, and so forth. And so, also notice in verse 13, the phrase, the church of God, is used. You know, we always talk about the church of Christ, where there's a bunch of different names in the New Testament for the Lord's church. Here, Paul calls it the church of God. He uses that several times throughout the book of, of Galatians. So, the Galatians were familiar with Paul's past. You know, he had made such an impact, such a statement in, in persecuting the church and, and getting letters from the, from the Jews to take and, and breathing murderous threats and all this, that they had heard about this. So his conversion, of course, was somewhat of a surprise, but also it gave his detractors a source of ammunition to use against him. Uh, they could say his, his conversion wasn't real and that he was still you know, trying to make an end run and, and persecute the church and so forth. But as I mentioned, Paul was surpassed by none in his determination and his enthusiasm and his manner of being zealous. In fact, at one point he says that uh, among peers his own age, none had surpassed him as far as following the Judea Judaism tradition and that kind of thing. And so he was just bound and determined to keep the law after he was converted, a true conversion, he was bound and determined to live the life for Jesus Christ. Verse 14 says he was exceedingly jealous for the traditions of fathers. Now, I want to just real briefly mention the word tradition. Uh, Paul here is using traditions to talk about the traditions of the, you know, the Hebrews and the Jews and the way that they did things. Traditions are important to the church of Christ, the church of God today too, though, right? We have certain traditions like Wednesday night Bible study, like uh, Sunday morning Bible study and other things that, that we do that you don't specifically find in the scriptures, but they're good and they're, they're, they're uh, beneficial for us and elders have set them aside, set us aside to do those. And so just it's interesting he uses the word traditions there. 
Uh, so our cross-reference study, verse 13, where Paul says in his former life he persecuted the church. You can turn over to Acts 9, verse 1, for example, and see how and where he persecuted the church. Acts 9, 1 says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. He went to the high priest to get the letters to allow him to do that. And then in Acts 22, verse 4, I persecuted this way. There's another name for the Lord's church, the way. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women. So he, he brings that zeal and enthusiasm to his newfound home with Titus. Uh, Acts 8, verse 1, And Saul approved of his execution. Who was executed? Stephen. Yeah. You know, Stephen was stoned to death, and and uh, Stephen's cloak and, and, and clothing and so forth was laid at the feet of Saul. And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And of course, that scattering, that diaspora, the book of James calls it, served the Lord's purpose. Instead of having the church just in Jerusalem, where was the church now? It was scattered throughout. Judea and Samaria and the other places. So the Lord even uses times of uh, travail and trouble to, to see his will and make it be done. And then 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, Paul himself, as he's talking about himself and describing himself, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So he still had a manner of, of humility, of being humble, recognized that what he had done in the past was wrong. But again, I think he brought that newfound zeal and enthusiasm to the Lord after his persecution. And then uh, here's kind of his, his resume that he lists for us in Philippians 3, verses 5 and 6. He was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal of a persecutor of the church as the righteousness under the law blameless. So some interesting things in that passage. He was circumcised on the eighth day. You remember the Hebrew male children were circumcised on the eighth day. We've since learned that uh, after day seven, a vitamin K is starting to be produced in the body, and vitamin K is a coagulant. It stops bleeding. And so that perhaps is why God said, baptized male children on the eighth day. Notice Paul talks about he was a persecutor of the church as to righteousness. He was under the law, but he was blameless. How could Paul call himself blameless? He was breathing murderous threats. He was going to the authorities, taking letters, so he would have the authority to, to go in and put down the church and persecuting Jesus. And How in the world could he be blameless? Oh, yes, sir. Louis. Uh, he, in his conscience, what he's doing is, <coughs> is per the, the law of, of, of Moses. So he is, in his conscience, he feels good. Okay. So Louis says, in his conscience, he still is blameless. He feels good. And, and I think that's true. You know, we were, we're just past that transition period, right, from, from going to Old Testament to New Testament. The church has just been established some... I forget now, about 30 or so years before this time. And up until that point, everyone did observe the, the way of the law of the Moses and, and, and the Jewish fathers and all. And so, you know, there's got to be some learning process as society and traditions die in, in this. So I, I can see how Paul would consider himself in his own conscience, as Louis said, as, as being blameless. Any other thoughts or comments about that? Yes, Dean. Yeah. Then he's blameless. He's doing what the chief priests and the, the leadership of the church uh, told him to do. Okay, so he's blameless under the old law way. Yeah. And under the leadership. Under the leadership. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. But the greater population is Jewish. They have not accepted. They didn't accept Christ. You know, so so nothing's changed in in the greater population mindset. You know, I mean, it's it's. it's Something new is attacking the old, and if he didn't accept Jesus as the, as the, as what was foretold, 
when nothing's changed. Right. Or attacking, persecuting that which is undermining what's still in existence is, is righteous. Yeah. All right. Good point. So uh, let's remind ourselves, what does the word blameless mean? Without blame. <laughs> Without blame, innocent. Yeah. The way I think about it is, is, you know, you're trying to attack a person's character and you just start throwing stuff up against the wall, you know, to see what sticks. The stuff that sticks is, is you know, the blame that could be attached to a person, but everything else is going to just fall off the wall. But, it's, yeah, it's, uh, you know, a charge is leveled against a person, but it just doesn't stick. It doesn't uh, take into account. It doesn't hold, if that makes sense to everybody. Uh, so, yeah, he had the resume of resumes as far as the Jews were concerned. All these things put him at the top of the class. And, and again, I think that makes him an ideal candidate to become who he became, this missionary and this, this, this writer of all these uh, gospel accounts and everything. And the point he's trying to make here is there's just no way that he, Paul, could come up with this new gospel because he never was... Uh, in, in association with other people who might be doing that kind of thing. He learned his gospel. He learned his, he got his apostleship, got his revelation from Jesus Christ himself. And so what he, he's saying, what he's teaching is must be true and accurate and correct. So he's trying to establish that threshold with the churches in Galatia. And then uh, th this was an interesting verse to me. 1 Timothy 1.13. Again, Paul here talking. He says, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. I thought ignorance was no excuse anymore. Acts 17. Paul acted ignorantly in unbelief. Remember on the road to Damascus, the Lord said, why, why are you kicking against the goad? Why, why are you trying to do something you shouldn't be doing? You know, and he, 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 uh, he just had that complete conversion. So I think his unbelief here is based on his ignorance of, of God's way. He had yet come to the light to see Jesus and to recognize who Jesus was and that he had started this new, uh, what do we call it, movement or whatever that he had started the Lord's church and that he had uh, placed himself in this position. So I think his ignorance was just based on lack of knowledge. You know, it wasn't that he was uh, dumb or anything like that, but it was just lack of knowledge who Jesus was. And when he learned who Jesus was, in fact, in Acts, where's that, Acts 9, where he has his conversion, he, he immediately started doing the things that Jesus would, would later have him to be doing in, in the preaching and teaching those things. So I, I, I like the word mercy there. God had his grand mercy, and we're going to see here later in our text how God called him uh, before he was in the womb, and he called him in a very special way. So I thought that was inter interesting. It says, I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Any thoughts, sir? Yes, Dan. Blameless. He was without sin under the old law. Right. And then he received new insight and additional information. And at that point, he recognized his sin. And that applies to all of us. Yeah. As, as we grow up and mature, at some point as Christians, we recognize that we are sinful. And God extends his, us mercy through our belief, our confession, our repentance, and baptism. Yeah. <coughs> Same thing that yeah. happened here. Yeah, good point. So the message for us is there's a lot of ignorant people. We need to be teaching, training them, explaining the way more perfectly. Yes, sir. I don't know if this really fits, but it, it made me think of the scripture where God says, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but lukewarm. I will want to vomit you out of my mouth. Yeah. So yeah. once you know the truth, there is no excuse. Yeah, that's a good point. Hadn't thought about that 
And also the scripture says that a, a person who goes away is like a pig, water in the mud, you know. Yeah, there's no excuse at all. Okay, and in Acts 23, 1, Paul here says, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And that's kind of what we've been talking about. Under the old law, he was the, the Jew of Jews. And he uh, was at the top of his course, top of, of his life, his former life there. And he lived in good conscience up to that day. I didn't know I had so many of these. Uh, oh, this is the Popeye verse. <laughs> what I call the Popeye verse. First Corinthians 15, 10. I am what I am. Isn't that what Popeye used to say? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. And, and this is the verse that I throw most of my weight on when I say Paul was the ideal candidate to become this, this apostle, this missionary, this, this writer of these books. He, he worked harder. He worked harder than any of them. Even when, before... When he was persecuting the church, he, he was working hard. And he took that same enthusiasm, that same zeal, that same hard work effort into doing what he did for Jesus Christ after his conversion. But he worked harder than any of them. Well, it makes me, you know, I think about when I, have, when I hold a position. Um, you know, something I really believe in something. Yeah. And all of a sudden I realized I was wrong. Uh, how hard that is to... One, accept it yourself. Yeah. And, and depending on how you held that position, you know, how how, how much I, I told others I held that position, it's humiliating to realize you were wrong and actually to, you know, take the other position and, and, and for all, you know, I, I can't even imagine being as zealous in, in, in the alternate position yeah. because of the humiliation of, of where you stood. And, and, and I can't even begin to think how Paul had to internalize that because not only was he just holding that position, I mean, he was zealous. He killed people for it. Yeah. And, and to turn that around, I mean, just, if you just think about what, you know, how, how, a, per, how a human is, is wired. Yeah. I, I just, you know, wow. Yeah, that, that really is a wow. It's, it's just remarkable. And I think that was one of the things that motivated him. You know, as, as much damage as he did against the Lord's church, I think that same motivation was in, in him to try to, Maybe not right the wrong, but try to do the right thing from there on out. And uh, I think that's a good position to take. To take. But you're right. Wow. How, how do you make that conversion with that, that human factor and that humiliation? Pretty remarkable. Any other thoughts or comments about that? And then verse 14, we, we talked about this, the traditions of the fathers. In Matthew 15, Jesus talks about uh, those who would Forsake the commandment of God for tradition. Uh, Matthew 15, verse 9 says, In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of me. We need to make sure the traditions we teach are, are, are what God has commanded us to teach. Okay, let's go on, verses 15 through 18. Unless anybody has anything else to comment on. When they thought in the Old Testament God was with them or they had prophets telling them things. So we know that God would not have told any prophet of the Jewish people to go kill Christians. So he, I know and understand why Paul thought he was blameless. Yeah. But if they told him to do it, it certainly didn't come from God. It was the Pharisees who were making up their own laws to go tell him to kill Christians. Yeah. And I think that's a good point to make because I was just sitting here that I had never really thought about that in my mind till listening and hearing. Yeah. Uh, it was a man-made thing to go tell Paul to kill Christians. He, even under the Mosaic law, said do not murder. But they, they went and killed people when God told them to go take over lands and kill the heathen people. Right. But in no way do we know that God would have sent through the Jewish Pharisees to kill Christians. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that before. And I'm not aware of a verse that, 
discusses Paul's motivation for this, other than his zealousness for the old Hebrew uh, religion. All. But you got to remember, Jesus, they thought they'd put this way down. They killed Jesus. They thought it was over and done with. And they didn't realize the power of the gospel. They didn't realize, I'm sure they didn't realize that on Pentecost, 3,000 would be baptized. And so these, these people, these, uh, these Pharisee leaders and the uh, Sanhedrin and all, they thought they got rid of this. They killed Jesus. And now here's this wave springing back up. And, you know, they were threatened. They, they uh, thought that, you know, their positions of power and all that stuff would be done away with. But they thought they'd gotten rid of that. Here it is springing back up again. But I think you're right when you made the comment about, you know, it's a man-made thing. It's just the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin trying to, from a man-made basis, put this down. Because they were supposed to obey the Ten Commandments. They said do not, do not kill. kill. Yeah, yeah, good point. Uh, pardon? Well, the whole, the whole, they killed Jesus. And that's who he was, that's who he was supporting. Yeah. Those people that killed Jesus, and, and if they went that far, he could just go keep going. Yeah. I mean, he had the, uh, not the not the law right, but he had man behind him. Those Jewish people had, and he was willing. I mean, all the way. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I didn't talk about that. Even, you, in you know, even in history, which is sad, even in history, in the name of Christianity, wars have been made. Like the Crusades and all, God yeah. did not uh, bless that. Yeah. That was man made. Yeah. So we've got to be really careful what we do in the name of, of God. Yeah. You know, it's curious to me that uh, the illustration is used uh, by, by God. We talk, he's talking to, to Paul, Saul Paul, when he's being converted. He says, You know, why do you kick against the goat? Y'all know what the goat is, right? It's a short, pointed stick that they use to move the. The sheep, you know, and you think about kicking a, a sharp pointed stick, it's got to really hurt. And it's just the usefulness of that idea. And I think that that's what God is trying to communicate to Paul. What you're doing is useless. You know, persecuting the way, trying to put down Jesus, you're never going to do it. How hard can you kick a pointed stick? <laughs> you know, not too hard. And you're going to quit eventually. you get your foot all, all bloody up. And I think that's the point that the scripture is trying to make to us there. You know, you're never going to be successful going against God, going against Jesus. It just, you know, might as well just bloody. Uh, saw a hand, uh, Jolita. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Um, when Jesus comes back for his saints, is he just going to Jerusalem? Or is he going to be in the sky? <clears throat> no. Uh, you can look at 2 Thessalonians, I think it's chapter 2, it talks about him coming again. It's going to be like a, a worldwide event. Uh, everything that we know of, the elements, everything's going to be burned up. There's going to be no earth. That's why Revelation talks about a new heaven, a new earth. But no, he's not coming back to Jerusalem. That, that's a, a false theory, or whatever you call it. Maybe it's called premillennialism. And uh, it says Jesus is going to come back to Jerusalem and reign a thousand years and all. But, but no, when he comes again. Uh, is it second? That's one is two thirteen. That runs right? first, first or second Peter, somewhere in there. <laughs> the end. Second Peter. Sanders says it's second Peter. Uh, yeah, the first time I'm thinking about saying that's one. where he's, he's trying to comfort the people who are worried about the, oh, it's the day of the Lord. Uh, that being reserved for fire is first Peter, second, <coughs> yeah, second Peter yeah, that's, seven. That's the, oh, it's first, first Thessalonians 1, uh, 5 through 12. And the verse about uh, the elements done with fire is, is second Peter. Uh, but read, read, uh, Jolita, read first Thessalonians Chapter 1, beginning verse 5. Yeah, the, the final coming of Christ will be world, uh, worldwide. Dead in Christ will rise. Everyone will hear. Okay, verses 15. Oh, I'm sorry, Doris. Yeah. Well, my question is, if you can just put it 
Is Judaism the same as the law of Moses? Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, Judaism is the uh, is the generic phrase for the law of Moses and those those Jews who followed the law of Moses. And I guess still do today. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else here? Verses 15 through 18. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and was and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him for 15 days. So what Paul is trying to get at here is he didn't get this, uh, this uh, revelation from man, this, this apostleship from man. He got it from God, from Jesus directly. So he didn't collude with the present apostles, or he didn't go and talk to, to, to Peter or Cephas or, or anyone to, to, to get his story straight that he had been taught, taught the Galatians. It's direct from God. And so again, it just makes these folks who are who are leaving the gospel and trying to turn to another one and everything and distort the gospel. It just makes it even worse that they're following, as Louise was saying earlier, they were following a man-made gospel, man-made religion. And Paul is saying, that, you know, I, I, I can't do that, you know. Uh, it's interesting, verse 15, it says, when, when it pleased God, he separated me from his mother's womb. Uh, there's some different thoughts as to what that means, but uh, you know, other places in the Bible, Paul talks about in the fullness of time Jesus came. In the fullness of time the gospel was made effect. And I think that may be what he's referring to here. His, the, the time of his birth was just right for him to be where he was on the road to Damascus and later the, the missionary and everything. He was born at the right right time. And that's why he was separated, you know, uh, <clears throat> was set apart before he was born. Because he was, he was called to specifically preach to the Gentiles. I mean, that was his, that was his passion, that was his mission. Where he had persecuted <laughs> the Jews before, his calling now was to go out into all the world after this diaspora, after this dispersion, and preach to the Gentiles. He was born at the right place, Born at the right time to fit into God's overall plan. Uh, and God revealed that divine plan to him again through this revelation. I got uh, two, two comments. Uh, okay. When it pleased God, it's in God's plan that Paul would preach. Absolutely. And the second comment, you would think with, with all the knowledge and training and everything that Paul has about the law of Moses, but most of the books, well, I think all of the books, are written to Gentiles. And somewhere in the middle of Acts, he said, I'm going to shake my, your, my, your dust off my feet, and I'm going to Gentiles. Yeah. And, and, you know, he had such knowledge, yeah. but God sent him to the Gentiles. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Isn't it? Yeah. And another thing I always think about Paul is, how could he have not known? If he was truly the, the other tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, and, and so versed in the, in the old law, how could he have not known that that, you know, Jesus is talked about from Genesis 3, 15 on. The whole Old Testament points toward Jesus. How could he not know him? But, you know, a lot of people didn't know that. They didn't realize that Jesus was the They truth. didn't study their Bible. Yeah. You know, all, so, the, all the leaders of Judaism and, you know, everybody rejected the Messiah. Yeah. Because they wanted a, they were looking for a physical kingdom. Yeah. And Jesus wasn't that. Yeah. That's true. Interesting. So uh, Paul was separated and he was called uh, so that he could reveal Jesus and other people. So God revealed his divine plan uh, to Paul and told him to go out and preach to the Gentiles. He didn't get to preach anything or everything he wanted. He was preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And again, the point about him not conferring with the others was it has to be from God because it's consistent with what the other apostles were preaching and teaching. And they couldn't get together to, to collude after this. Uh, so 
So let's talk about being called. Um, Isaiah 49 1, and there was a passage in Jeremiah also called about they were called to preach the gospel. Isaiah 49 1 says, Listen to me, O coastlands, give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he called, uh, excuse me, he named my name. So Jeremiah says something real similar to that. Paul was called. I, what I want to get to is how are we called today? You know, we're supposed to make our calling and election sure. How are we called today? And what does that mean to be called? We, we obey the gospel. We obey the gospel. That's, okay. You know, and that gospel does the rest. Okay, so you're saying the gospel is the call. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 uh, I'm saying that um, today the Holy Spirit or any other thing doesn't personally call me to obey the gospel. You know, he doesn't do, it doesn't work that way, but once you've been called to obey the gospel, then you're in line with God's plan. Okay. All right, so let's find the gospel. Anything else? How are we called today? Um, God calls all men to repent. He wishes that none should perish. So he calls all of us to repent. Yeah. Let's see if okay. I go and get the list of our point. Well, I think it, it's a miracle within itself uh, how how your parents may bring, bring you up to church uh, and how you have to struggle. You see Paul's life within your own. Yeah. How you struggle, maybe like me, you struggle to be a Christian, but but the Word of God has its way. It yeah. just uh, guides us and keeps us, and uh, before you know it, you're yeah. Now, it's amazing to me. You know, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God. I don't think we understand that power. I don't think we understand how the gospel can change mankind's hearts. I don't think we understand that, you know, the gospel is the, the saving message from God. I've told y'all before, y'all remember the story of uh, the meanest man in Texas, Clyde Thompson? I think I've told that story before. Back in the, uh, I forget the years, but I think it's the 1920s, there was a man by the name of Clyde Thompson, and he killed a man. He was taken to trial, he was convicted, he was uh, sentenced to prison uh, for life. While he was in prison, he killed another man, I think it might have been a, a guard. And uh, this was right here in Texas at the Huntsville prison. And back in those days, the Huntsville church had a prison ministry, they'd go in and distribute Bibles and everything, and after some time, Clyde Thompson picked up a Bible, just on his own, a double murder, I don't know what kind of childhood he had or anything, but a double murder, he picked up the Bible, started reading it, the gospel called him, he got a prison guard to baptize him, and after many, many years, somehow he got a, uh, what do you call it, a parole, and was released from prison, and he set up a little house or something outside the prison gates and until the day he died everyone that left prison he gave them a, a suit and a bible but this man was a double murderer on death row and somebody handed him a bible and he was converted if that's not the power of the gospel if that's not a calling by the gospel then I don't know what is and, and it's, it's the gospel that calls us 2 Thessalonians 2, 14. To this, he called you through our gospel. And I think this is the point Louis was making. So that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the power of, of, of God's word is just, I don't know how to describe it, it's just astounding. It's the power to save. James, James says, let the implanted word be hidden in your heart. It's the power to save. And so that's why we need to be real careful that we're preaching and teaching God's word, which is exactly what Paul did, because we're called through the gospel. If we try to call through anything else, we're, we're guilty of doing the same thing that Galatians are doing and trying to distort the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the word of God that saves. It's the power of the gospel. Uh, first of some other verses that discuss this. 1 Timothy 6.12 Fight the good fight of the faith.
take hold of the eternal life to which you've been called. The eternal life, heaven, eternity, to which you've been called, and about which you made the good confession of presence of many witnesses. First Peter 2 9. But you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that's Paul, isn't it? He was called out of darkness into the marvelous light. Same thing for each of us, right? Every one of us in this room, every baptized believer in this room has been called out of darkness, Jesus is the light, into Jesus' marvelous light. Every single one of us, whatever our conversion story is, just like Paul, just like all of us, we've been called out of that darkness. And then here's a verse I mentioned earlier, 2 Peter 1.10. Therefore, brothers, be the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you'll never fail. Those qualities are those eight things. Uh, start with faith and go to virtue. And I can't recite it from memory. But you, you climb that Christian ladder of grace. But he says, be diligent to confirm your calling and election. You know, being a Christian is not some pastime, some avocation, some, some hobby. It's our life. So we need to be diligent to confirm our calling and election. Any other thoughts about, about calling? Well, I can't, in, in no way, again, call through the gospel. But we as, I mean, God created us. And so we have a need uh, to, to seek God. Yeah. I mean, I, there, there's just a, Something. I mean, you, you look across the world, all the religions that have grown up, you know, was for some, you know, as a created being to seek out the higher power. And, and, and again, uh, through God, we're, we're called. And, and the gospel sh gives us what that looks like. And, and we can see that. And, and, and I, I, I'm confident in my, my calling that, that, even, that God created me and therefore he wants me to be part of him and I see that in the gospel so I don't separate it, the gospel is the calling but I was born with the need to, to, to worship God yeah. um, and as, as a created being of God. Yeah, yeah that's very true there's a, there's a passage in Ecclesiastes I can't think where it is, it's second or third chapter, that says that something to the fact that eternity has been uh, has been placed into man's heart a sense of eternity a, a sense that there's a higher being, a sense that there is God and I think everybody recognizes and acknowledges there's a God. Even, even atheists, you know. Everybody does. And so the, the original sin, Adam and Eve, separated man from God. There's only one way that can be brought back together. And, and Second Peter here talks about calling and election. The election part to me is our response. How many people have heard the gospel and said, ah, that's not for me. And turn their back. Even in Jesus' day, read John chapter 6 about the people that, that turned their backs on Jesus and walked away because of his, his tough teaching. How many people have heard the gospel and said, well, and so there's got to be some response on our part. And that's the election. That response is, you know, hear, believe, repent, confess, repent, be baptized, right? That, that there's got, you know, it's not just, it's not just blanket grace and mercy and then you just go eat, drink, and be merry and do whatever you please. There's got to be a response on mankind's part. Further to that, I've mentioned Ecclesiastes. I think about really the Psalms. You know, they, if you read those and, and, you, and you, you see David's heart, you know, it's that longing for God, you know, and, yeah. and David was a man after God's own heart. I mean, if anyone could, could sense that connection, it was David. I mean, just throughout the Psalms, that need, um, you know, and he, he fell away. But boy, you know, he recognized all of a sudden that gap, and you know, and, and, and he was brought back. He lamented uh, yeah. his need to return to God. And yeah. So I think that's fundamental to, to, to how we arrive at, at the need to, to be with God. Yeah, good point. Lord. I think it's in the first chapter of Romans where God said, "Man is without excuse. You should have known me even through nature." Yeah. So that kind of goes on. What Kevin's saying, we have this need. 
And God said, even through nature, you know that, sh that I'm here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. We're going to talk about, in our sermon this morning, Peter walking on water and the storm and everything. What amazes me about that story is just a few weeks or months earlier, similar situation, the disciples were out, the storm came up, Jesus was asleep. He stilled the storm, he said, and the disciples said, truly, you're the Son of God. And then here again, this, this, this massive storm, and the, the disciples were scared to death again. Didn't they learn? You know, Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Uh, Kevin talked about nature. I, I've done a lot of hunting and fishing in my day. I tell you, some of the things in nature that you see are just, just incredible. I'll never forget, I was out on Lake Georgetown one late fall day, and it was cold and crisp and clear. Lake Georgetown is a core of Engineer Lake, and so there's no houses or anything around it. So it's just built up, and it's all cedar trees. And it was the time of year when the cedars were casting off their pollen, and those sheet cedar trees would just start, like, moving, shaking. And then it's like there was an explosion. You, you could just see this cloud of the pollen going up. And I'm thinking, wow. You know, it's just so incredible. Uh, just think we're breathing all that. <laughs> uh, we're still in awe when we see a rainbow. Yeah. Even the people who don't even act like they care about God at all, they still, there's something about that rainbow. Yeah. Uh, a couple yeah. weeks ago, when we see a, a rainbow, rainbow, we just... There was. Patty and I stepped out that night on our back porch and looked off to the east, and we saw that double white rainbow. We could see it from end to end. You know what? There wasn't a pot of gold at the bottom of it either. That's what, that's what I thought. <laughs> Patty and I drove in Friday night late on the back side of that storm, and the lightning display was just unbelievable. Some of those lightning bolts were crack, and I'm thinking, I need my sunglasses. And it looked like they were an inch wide hitting the, hitting the ground. And then it was just like spider web, just, you know, go all over. And Patty and I were just loving watching the, the display of God through all that. I know it was a terrible storm and all, but wow, it was just something else. Uh, tell you what, I wanted to get through this. We've only got a minute or so left. Let's read this, and, and uh, we're going to chapter 2 next week. Getting in verse 19. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, in what I am writing to you before God. I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They were only hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. So again, the message here is, Paul is saying, you know, this is from God and not from man. There's only one gospel. It's confirmed and it's sure because I got it right. Paul says, he got it right from God. He didn't get with man and say, okay, let, let's cook up this story for these unsuspecting people. He, he went into these different regions, and, and it says at the end, the, the, the bottom line was, verse 24, they glorified God because of him and his conversion. He was the one who used to preach to persecute the church, and now he's preaching the faith. And that, that's an effective message. The one who was persecuting the uh, church so much, does an about face, does a repentance, and is now uh, promoting the church in the same manner that he tried to persecute it earlier. Any final thoughts or comments? Mike, I heard a, a lawyer say that's one of the that's the best witness to have on your side is somebody who was opposite in and completely different thinking. He said you put them on the stand, you let them talk. Is that right? It's the best best person on your side. Yeah. Certainly worked for Paul. Close the Lord of Prayer. Any final thought, comment? Thank you so much. Good class this morning. Appreciate your your wisdom and your insights and your, your contributing to class. It just makes it a lot better class for all. Let's pray out, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Bible study hour that you've given us, and we pray that you would help us to take this message with us in our daily life. We pray that we have gained some insight and some further direction. In, in the gospel and how pure and true and right it is. 
We pray that we'd be able to effectively communicate with others just as, just as Paul did. Communicate to others about this Jesus Christ that we serve. May we always be a blessing to others. May we always have an answer to others who ask us about why we do the things we do in accordance with the, with the Holy Scripture. Dear God, we ask that you continue to be with us here at the Heart of Texas Church of Christ. We pray for each and every one of us that are together in this family. Give us long life and good years and deep understanding of who Jesus is and, and just keep us together in love and joy and harmony here as a family. This is such a beautiful, wonderful place that you have created. We, we just thank you very much that you have, you have put us in this place. And as always, dear God, we thank you so much for Jesus. The words just don't come to us about how much we love Jesus and how appreciative we are in his manner of life and his words and especially his death and his burial and his resurrection. May we, may we always have Jesus on our hearts and our minds and our thoughts and try to do the best we can to live that holy life, to be justified and righteous in your sight. And then always, uh, as always, reach out to others and, and communicate to them their need for Jesus. We just thank you so much for all this, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you all very much. Love you all.
Good morning. It's about time for us to get started this bright and sunny Lord's Day. Appreciate all of you being here. Thank you on Facebook for being with us also. We got several visitors in the audience this morning. We want you to know you're our honored guest. We have some non-visitors too. Kevin and Monica are here and Wayne. They're not really visitors, they're family. Be back with us soon. But thank you for being here this morning. It's a beautiful day, beautiful Lord's Day. Wanted to make you aware, you may have noticed we've got some ushers and some greeters now. We've asked the greeters to get here about 15 minutes or so early and greet us. We're a warm, friendly, loving congregation, and that's just all part of it, right? So that'll that'll brighten things up and, and make things better for each and every one of us. So our folks serving this morning. David Fleming will be our song leader. Greg Crump has the opening prayer. Communion comments, Wesley Jackson. The communion cup and offering, Dallas Douglas and Wyatt Beeble. Scripture reading, Josiah Monroe. And our elders comments are Ozzie Monroe. The greeters are the Joneses. The ushers are Cedric Jones and David Kirkman. Again, it's a beautiful day, wonderful day to be here. You know, it's just so good to be among family. We've got a great crowd this morning. I think I mentioned last week we need to put some more chairs out, blow the place up, expand it, and we'll, we'll get going on that. We're going to open with a word of prayer, and then I'd ask that we just burst out in song as Brother David leads us, and that will inspire us, and educate us, and encourage us as we go through the week. If you'd bow with me at this time, please. <clears throat> Dearly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us to worship. We are in such awe and humbled by being here this morning, knowing that we're in your presence. Knowing all that you have done for us, knowing that you're the Lord of our life, and knowing that you and your blessed Son are the light of the world. And dear God, as we come together as a family to, to worship you, we pray that it is pleasing, that it is acceptable. And that we encourage and edify one another in the songs that we sing, in the way that we are led in prayer, in the gospel message that is delivered. Dear God, we live in tough times. But we know that you're always with us. We know that your son lived in tough times. And yet he was able to walk this earth in every way as we are yet without sin. And that is our goal, that is our model. And we pray that you help us to achieve that, to help us to achieve the righteousness that should be in our life. And as we worship you and, and, and lift up your name, we're, we're just in awe. This, this past Friday night, we had a tremendous storm come through, and to know that you're Lord of the heavens and the earth, and that all these things are set into motion, and, and this system that we call nature just, just astounds us at the beauty and the majesty and the power. Of course, all that pales in comparison to you, dear God. We just thank you for life. We thank you for giving your son to this earth so that each of us could not only have a life here, but a life beyond after we, after we go to sleep. We pray, dear God, that we would make our calling and election sure and be diligent about that as we discussed in our Bible class this morning. And dear God, we just can't wait for that day when we will look Jesus in the eye Give him a hug and hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Come thou unto me. We love you, God. We love Jesus. We love the Holy Spirit. And we just pray that you continue to be with us. Guide, guard, and direct us. Make our path straight and our way sure as we diligently do our very best to follow you. Again, we just thank you for everything, dear Holy Father, and may this worship be pleasing and acceptable to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing to you among the
next song we'll sing. Following this song, we'll have our word of prayer, and uh, Brother Greg Crump will lead us in that prayer. Let us pray, please. We thank you, Father, for all your blessings that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for the rain. We thank you for sparing us with the hurt from the storm and everything like that, and be with the ones that did um, get damaged and, and help them to restore their houses and businesses back. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who came to this earth, who uh, died on the cross for our sins who was resurrected and ascended to heaven. And we thank you so much for the promise of us being able to go to heaven, help us to live the life that you'd want us to live, Father. Help us to tell others about you and be able to share your word. Um, and so others can go to heaven also. Thank you for being with us today. Let us um, uh, sing songs of praises and rejoice that we're alive and, and and lift your name up in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yeah. We'll sing this next song and following this song we'll be partaking of the Lord's Supper. Uh, if you would, let's stand for this song. We're seeing all three verses. We gather
Good morning, everyone. Now's the time for our communion. And as we do uh, partake of the Lord's Supper, let us remember uh, all that he has done for us. And the comments I have today is, um, we all seen the commercial Jake from State Farm. We um, see the man making the phone call at 3 a.m. We have Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, and Drake, and then we have the one to, uh, about Maya. So now let us replace Jake with State Farm. I mean, let us replace Jesus with uh, instead of instead of Jake, because of the because of the death, burial, and resurrection resurrection of our Lord. We have access to call on him at 3 a.m. in the morning when things are not going well or our hearts are heavy and burdened. Also, if we just want to talk, but that's the blessings that we receive from him because of the work that he died on the cross. He's there interceding for us on the right hand of God. And then there's the lady who bring, brings him all the pizza and telling him that he's the man. Well, in scripture, Acts chapter 4, verses 12 says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Also in 1 John 3 and 5, it says, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. He was that perfect sacrifice that no other could, uh, could do, and his blood still cleanses us today. And Maya gives him extra stakes for the huge, huge savings that he saved her. What more the praise and honor and worship and glorify that we could do for our Lord and any other accolades or shout outs to our Lord and Savior. But one of the biggest savings is from his work on the cross that our souls are no longer in danger of being lost for lost in eternity or for eternity. And he has gone and prepared a mansion for us. What a friend we have in Jesus. Yeah. Let us give uh, thanks for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the bread which represents your son's broken body. Let us take it with clean hands and pure hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now let's um, give thanks for the cup. And that is, I'm reading from Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 for this one. It says, then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shared for many for the remissions of sins. Let us give thanks for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the cup, which represents your son's shedded blood. Let us take it in a manner that is well-pleasing unto you. All these blessings we ask in your son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. Now, another part of our service is the offering, and that scripture reading is coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, and it reads as following. 
Now concerning the collections for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so must you do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Let us give thanks for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this offering. Thank you for the ones who gave, and thank you for the ones who had the desire to give, but didn't have it to give. May this offering be used in a manner that is well-pleasing unto you. All these blessings we ask in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Sing all three verses of this next song. sing all three verses of this next song. <coughs> Following this song, Josiah will be reading the scripture for us, and then Mike will bring us our lesson for today.
415. Good morning. I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him on the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, after he dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was alone. And the boat was already considered distance from the land, buffeted the way, by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before the dawn, Jesus went out of them, walked on the lake. When the, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out of fear. But Jesus said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come onto the water. Come on, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked onto the water, came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus walked out of his hand. Walked. Immediately, Jesus reached out of his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed out of the boat, the wind died down, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Morning, church. It is good to see everyone here this morning. Thank you for being here. Have you noticed how nice our, our stage area looks here? Chelsea Prince, I don't think the Princes are here today. Uh, she's been working on this for us. I'm sure Jamar has been assisting with the color coordination and, and all that. Hey, just a couple of reminders. VBS is coming up. It is June 12th, and I believe it starts at 10 a.m. And also on the little back table, there's some applications for Camp Bandina. And we're trying to find a, a good date. We can have us a churchwide picnic out at the lake. Uh, but the dates I've been looking at, they're all booked up right now. So we'll... We'll work on that and try and find it so we can all get together. And I'm sure we can maybe convince Ozzy to do a little barbecue in. <laughs> all right, all right, right, Ozzy? Our lesson this morning is entitled, Dare to Leave the Boat. You know, we had a big old storm come through Friday night. That was really something, wasn't it? There was trees down. I saw a video somewhere on Facebook that there was a tornado in the vicinity. I don't know exactly where, but there was trees down and everything. Patty and I were coming back late from Austin. We had a date. We were coming in late, and uh, I was talking in Bible class. The display of lightning was something else. That was so cool. We had a blast, except for the 70-mile-an-hour winds and the 5-inch rain. But <laughs> the rest of it was pretty cool. But you know what? There's always going to be storms in our life. And over the next few weeks, next few Sundays, we're going to focus on Jesus. I have come more and more into the realization that we need to be doing this in our corporate worship life. The Old Testament focuses forwards towards Jesus. Here in the New Testament times, in the days of Jesus, he is our all. He is our one and our only. And so we need to focus on Jesus. And that is one thing that Peter, I think we'll see in our story, failed to do. So the story is told of a man who was hanging by his rope off a cliff. Thousand foot drop. And he's tired. He's calling out, help me, help me. Is anyone up there? Help me, help me. And his fingers are getting tired and his muscles are starting to ache and he, he keeps looking down at that thousand foot drop and just thinking, oh, woe is me. What am I going to do? He keeps calling out, save me, save me. Is anyone up there? And finally, this voice speaks out and says, son, I'm here. And the man says, who, who are you? You're, you're my Savior. Who are you? And the voice replies, it is God. The man says, oh, thank you. Thank you, God. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Help me up. I need to get up. And the voice says, son, let go. And there's this long pregnant pause, and the man says, well, wait a minute, God. It's a, it's a thousand-foot drop. Can you, can you just... Give me the strength to pull myself up. Can, can you assist me getting up somewhere, up on, on top of the cliff? And the voice once again says, let go. 
And there's another long pregnant pause. And finally the man who's hanging on by the rope says, uh, well, is there anyone else up there? There's only one Jesus. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one gospel. There's only one. There's only one name whereupon men may call to be saved. Brother Wesley referenced that passage in our communion comment. Folks, we need to be looking towards Jesus. We need to be focusing towards Jesus. In our story this morning, Peter looked at circumstances around him. He looked at the wind and the waves and the tremendous storm, took his eye off of Jesus. Folks, we need to focus on Jesus. And sometimes that means we need to just let go and let God. Just realize who we are and who God is. Trust in God. He will see you through and see you through the way. Wouldn't it be great, though, if we could make this promise? Hey, if you'll be baptized, everything will be great. Everything will be perfect. You'll never have any worries. You'll never have any troubles. Just become a baptized believer. It doesn't work that way, does it? The rain falls on the just and the unjust. You know that old preacher saying, if there was enough, if you're on trial to be a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something. If you are living the life of Jesus Christ, you'll be persecuted. Things won't go your way. And Jesus never says, you know what? Because you're now a baptized believer... I'm going to build a force field around you. You'll never have any money problems. You'll never have any health problems. You'll never have any family problems. It doesn't work that way. As Christians, we have problems just like everyone else in the world does. But we have Jesus on our side. In our story this morning, Jesus is in a mournful, grieving way. At the end of of uh, chapter 13, Jesus in his own hometown in Nazareth has been rejected. These people come up and say, where did this man get this wisdom and this mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is this is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? They doubted Jesus, and as a result of that, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Oh, Lord, help us with our unbelief. And then when we move into chapter 14 of Matthew, Herod the Tetrarch brings John the baptizer's head on a platter to the court. And Jesus learns in verse 12 that John the baptizer, his cousin, has passed. So Jesus wants to go away. He wants to get off by himself. He wants to isolate himself, withdraw to a desolate place. Why, why does Jesus, when Jesus wants to go off, what does he do? He prays. When Jesus wants to go off by himself, he wants to pray. But the multitudes follow him out there, and he had compassion on these poor people, and he started healing them. And towards evening, it was getting late. They were hungry. They were tired. They were thirsty. The disciples came to him and said, Send him away. Let him go buy some food. And Jesus says, no, you give him something to eat. And the disciples say, we only have five loaves and two fish. And so Jesus sat him down, blessed the food, and distributed it. How many baskets were left over? Remember, they had an abundance, 12 baskets left over. And then verse 22, Jesus immediately sends his disciples into the boat to go away what does he want to do he wants to spend more time in prayer he is still mourning and grieving over the loss of John the baptizer and sometimes I wonder especially in my own life when those storms of trial burst above our head when it seems like life is passing us by when we're called to do the impossible when we have trial and tribulation after trial and tribulation, where is our Jesus-like spirit 
to seek solace through prayer. When the storms of life hit you, what do you do? Brothers and sisters, pray. Follow Jesus' example. Because I'm going to tell you something. I won't lie to you. Hard times are coming. Not because of what's going on in the world, but just because of who we are. If we follow Jesus Christ, hard times will be there, will come. Guess who else is there with us? Jesus, the Messiah, walking side by side. You see, Jesus has been on this earth already. He's experienced everything you have, yet he did it without sin. And do you know where Jesus is today? What is Jesus doing today for all of us? He is sitting at the right hand of God. He is advocating for you. He's the best counselor, best attorney you could ever think of or, or, or want to have because he's been there. He's got that experience. So in our lesson text, look at verses 22 through 24 with me. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him on the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat, by this time, was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. A big old storm came up. You see, the Sea of Galilee sits down in a, in, in a bowl. And on one side of it are some high hills, mountain like mountains, and the storms build up on the backside, and they kind of roll over those mountains, and, and they're just there. They come up suddenly. I was fishing on Lake Buchanan one day. I was by those two islands that are right out from Burnett County Park. And back to the, I guess that's the north, there's some ki kind of tall, high hills. And I was catching fish. I wasn't watching the water. I was too busy putting those white bass in the boat. And this old storm came up. And all of a sudden, it's wind and rain and lightning. I know how quick those storms can come up. How quick do the storms of life hit you? Are you ever prepared? Are you ever ready? Think about who's in this boat. These disciples, a lot of them, were fishermen. They knew that lake. They knew storms came up suddenly over the hills. They know how big and bad the wind and the waves and the, and, and the water can get. They knew the capabilities of that boat. They knew they had to row just a certain way so they wouldn't be swamped and, and, and waves overtake them. Who put them out there in the first place? Jesus said, get the boat and go. They were obedient. Many times when we're obedient to God's holy direction, storms will still appear. It's not a question of if, it's when. When you get up every morning and you put on the full armor of God, remember, you've also got the sword of the Spirit in your hand. Fight back against Satan. Fight, fight back against the principalities of the power of darkness. God's not going to ever leave you or abandon you. And many times our storms are not physical. They're not five-inch rains like we had Friday night. They're spiritual. We're not spending enough time in prayer. We're not spending enough time reading God's Word. We're not spending enough time meditating or communing with God. Don't be that person. Look at 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Paul says, indeed, all... Who's all? Th that's us. Raise your hand. Who's all? Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's really attractive, isn't it? God's there with you. Jesus is walking side by side in the way with you. What does one of the Beatitudes tell us? Matthew 5, verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. What's the upside here? What is the upside? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's a path, there's a way to righteousness. And then going on, verses 25 through 27. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them 
walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately, verse 27 says, Immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. It's the fourth watch of the night. That's between 3 and 6 a.m. I don't know what time they left the, the, the shore, what time Jesus sent them out, but it, it must have been early evening or so. They had been laboring against this storm all night long. And Jesus, according to John, was going to pass by. How could they not recognize Jesus? These disciples had been living with Jesus, working with Jesus, eating with Jesus. And this wasn't the first time they'd been in a storm together. Earlier in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus is asleep on the boat, and they had to wake him up and say, Hey, we're perishing. Don't you care about us? Oh, ye of little faith. They were tormented. They hadn't let, yet learned to trust in Jesus. In Matthew 27, uh, 14, 27, and verse 31, the word immediately, Jesus immediately said to them, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. He didn't say, Hey, I'm Jesus, I'm here. They knew, they recognized his voice. Notice the word immediately. When you need help, when you're going through trials and tribulations, how long does it take Jesus to respond to you? Immediately, Jesus is there for us. I, I just can't get over the fact that the disciples didn't know Jesus. They didn't recognize Jesus. Maybe it was too dark, too stormy, too, too much wind, rain, water, but they didn't recognize Jesus. Have we ever got to that point? Have we ever got to the point where we think, well, our check, my checkbook will see me through. I've got enough knowledge. I, I can do this. I'll call on my friends. They'll help me through this trial, this storm. No. Call upon the name of the Lord. Jesus understands. I, I use the word immaturity. I shouldn't have used that word. Jesus understands our faith. Wherever we're at in the walk of our faith, Jesus understands where you are. Jesus knows you. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows your every careless thought. Jesus is with us. Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there also. But just because Jesus is with us doesn't mean there, there is no response on our part. Psalms 42, 1 says, As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. We have to seek after Jesus with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, with every fiber of our being. And then verse 28 through 31. Peter, it's going to get out of the boat. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Don't ask me, tell me, command it. That way it's your fault, Jesus, if anything happens. Command me to get out of the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He said, Lord, save me. Jesus, here's that word again, immediately reached out his hand took hold of him, saying, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter got out of the boat. He said, hey, it's good enough for Jesus, good enough for me. But Peter let the circumstances distract him. You notice no one else got out of the boat with Peter. I don't know what they were thinking, but no one else did. Did they think Peter was a show-off? Did they say, oh, there goes impetuous Peter again? We don't know. 
But Peter was the only one that got out of the boat. Folks, we're made to fight the fight. We're made to run the race. We're made to go into battle for Jesus. We're not made for ducking our head in the sand and for avoidance. God gave us talents and abilities not to hide in the sand, but to use them. When Peter became afraid, verse 30 says he was afraid when he saw the wind beginning to sink. He said, Lord, save me. How close was Jesus to Peter? He was close enough that Peter, that, that, that Jesus was able to take his hand and take hold of him. When you go through those storms of life, those trials, those tribulations, how far away from you is Jesus? He was apparently arm's length here. Good old Peter. He saw the winds and the waves. Folks, don't focus on your situation. Don't focus on everything that's negative. You can find plenty of the negative. Don't focus on how bad things are going for you. Oh, poor, pitiful me. <laughs> Don't focus on the circumstances. Focus on Jesus. Don't let the weight of your problems crush you. Peter let fear and doubt displace his faith. Oh, God, let that never happen among us. Peter was afraid. He doubted. His faith was sinking along with him. Jesus immediately, immediately reached out to save him. In verses 32 through 33, when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. What is it going to take for us to make that statement? Truly, you are the Son of God. Does Jesus have to come down and perform a miracle in front of us? It didn't work in 33 AD for all the people. Is God going to have to do something just spectacular in your life? It won't be enough. We need to grasp that Jesus is all-powerful. Jesus can do anything. And so our awe, our adoration, and our worship must be on Jehovah God and His blessed Son. We need a full understanding of who Jesus is. You don't get that by osmosis. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Read your Bibles daily. Pray without ceasing. Learn who Jesus is. Why did Jesus save Peter? Let him sink. He didn't have trust and faith in God in the first place. Let him sink. No, no. Jesus loves us. No matter who we are, what we've done, where we've been, Jesus loves us. We are children of God. And he wants all men everywhere to repent, come to salvation. He'll never be far from us. He'll never forsake us. And so, yes, we need to pray without ceasing. Yes, we need to recognize and understand that we walk by faith and not by sight. Our path is not laid out for us. But Jesus is the light of the world, and Jesus lights that pathway for us. All we got to do, all that we got to do is walk the straight and the narrow. Because living the Christian life is so wonderful, so great. Would to God that all would come to a knowledge and an understanding. Apostle Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Folks, storms of life are going to come your way. You're going to be persecuted. Paul says, do not be anxious about, everything, about anything, but in everything by prayer 
and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. Ask, seek, knock, and ye shall find. A preacher one time told me about this verse. He says, you know, anytime we pray for something, we ought to go ahead and thank God for the answer. He's going to answer. Verse 27, verse 31, two times, immediately, Jesus responded. Immediately, he responded when they were afraid, thinking he was a ghost. Immediately, he responded when Peter started sinking. When you pray, God is going to immediately be there for you. His answer may not come right away, but he will answer. But he is immediately there for you. When the storms of trial burst above your head, who is always there for you? Jesus. When you're lower than a snake's belly, who is always there for you? Folks, I'm going to tell you, man will always disappoint you. Jesus will never disappoint you. And yes, we need to be courageous. We need to know that Satan is a mighty warrior. But he's going to be put down like a dog by Jesus. We've got to have the courage to obey. But folks, nothing happens unless our eyes are on Jesus. If we lose sight, if we lose focus of Jesus, it ain't going to happen. You can't lose your focus on Jesus. Day in, day out. Paul in Colossians says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Everything on this earth is going to go away. It's going to rust or it's going to break or it's going to deteriorate or, or one day all the very elements are going to be burned up. But if your minds are on things above, oh, Amen. We may lose these earthly tents, but we have an eternal soul. We have an eternal soul that is going to rest with God in heaven. So, three messages this morning. Know that you're going to face storms. They're, they're coming. Know that you're going to face storms. But know that God is with you. Know that God will never forsake you. God will never depart. You may depart from God if you're foolish enough. God will never be far from you. And folks, we've got to get out of the boat. We can't stay in the safe confines of a boat that's still floating in the middle of the storm. Get out of the boat. Use your spiritual sword. Use the talents and abilities that God has given you. Get out of the boat. So there's a real crucial lesson here about Peter. Peter's heart apparently was full of good intentions. He got out of the boat. And before he got out of the boat, he called upon God. Look, God, Jesus, if it's you, let me come to you. His heart was full of some good intentions. Although his faith faltered, at the end, he and the other disciples were worshiping. Peace be still. When the wind and the waves are calm, when you're in peace, when God has responded, when God has acted in your life, when God has stilled your storm, let us all with one accord say, Truly, this is the work of the Son of God. That's what Peter did, sinking in fear, he called on the Lord. When you're sinking in fear, when you're sinking in lack of faith, when you're sinking because of doubt, who are you going to call on? Who else? Jesus. And that is faith at work. Peter had faith. And Jesus had faith in Peter. And I know that Jesus has, has faith in each and every one of you. I know Jesus has great things planned for you, in store for you. 
I know that you're going to excel. Because God is with us. May God bless the heart of Texas Church of Christ. I want to close with a prayer. If you'd bow with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, you have created us out of love and for your love. And so here at the heart of Texas Church of Christ, we ask for protection in the troubles and storms of life. We ask that you bless us who are struggling against great odds. We pray for those of us who are suffering from persecution, from violence, or from ridicule. Dear God, we humbly beseech you and ask that you remember those of us whose lives are at risk, those of us who are exhausted. We know, dear Lord, our God, that you are a very present help in time of trouble. We know you're ready to hear our cry and come to our aid. Lord, help us not to be afraid. Help us to put our trust and our hope in you. We pray for your blessing, dear God. There's there's those among us that are world-weary. We are worried. We are worn. Dear God, some of us feel overwhelmed. Some of us are unable to cope. We ask that you bless each and every one of us. We remember, dear God, those who are ill at home or in hospital and those who care for them. We pray especially for those who are involved in accidents or those whose illness finds no cure. Dear God, there are many of us who need a Savior. We give you thanks for the safety and protection that you provide. We thank you that you lead us through our struggles. We thank you that you replace doubt and fear with faith. We thank you for being the Holy Savior of the world. And we ask that you continue to be with the heart of Texas Church of Christ as we diligently and with all of our mind, all of our heart, all of our soul, follow thee. And we know we're going to fall short, dear God. We know at times we're going to exhibit a lack of faith. General Heavenly Father, we ask that you gently lead us back to the straight and the narrow path during those times. We know you're the way and the only way. Dear God, we just ask that you always be with us and, and help us learn from this lesson this morning that, that you are with us and you will immediately reach out and give us what you deem necessary for us. We thank you for everything, dear God. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Our invitation this morning, can we help you with your working faith? Can we help you boot up and strap up? Can we help you put on the whole armor of God? Can we help you keep your eyes on Jesus? Can we help you know that there is one way and only one way? And there's only one name upon under heaven whereupon men may call to be saved. Can we immediately pray for you? How can we help you this morning? How can we help see you through the storms of life and trial and tribulation? Brothers and sisters, be strong. Be strong. Jesus is here with us. May God bless the name of Jesus. If we can help you in any way, we ask that you come and let us know your, your needs while we stand and sing this good song. Each step I take, my Savior goes before me.
weeks ago, my brother died of cancer. Last July, August, her sister passed her cancer. And she's got a spot on her liver that they're looking into. So uh, she just asked for prayers, for comfort, asked that God respond uh, to this, this dreadful disease. I know cancer is something that it's affected a great many of us. And I told her that, that Patty, my wife, was battling cancer now and looking for radiation. So I certainly know where you're coming from and, and your husband, too. So let's, let's pray for Dorothy and her husband and, and uh, ask for God's blessing yeah. in this situation. <clears throat> Dear Father, we, we humbly beseech you at this time asking that you be with Dorothy and her husband. Uh, Dorothy has suffered great loss with her brother and sister in recent times. We pray, dear God, that this spot on her liver is just nothing. Uh, and if it turns out to be something, we pray that your healing hand take care of it. We know that you know, mankind has advanced greatly due to your uh, putting all the things in motion that that make it possible for man to have new advances and new medicines and new treatments. And, and, and we thank you that you put all that in place for us. We just, just zealously ask right now that you be with Dorothy and, and be with her husband and give her the peace and comfort that only you can provide and also the healing. But we know you're called the great physician, dear God, and we just ask at this time that you... You intervene and, and, uh, on her behalf. And, uh, we thank you so much for allowing us to make this request. And we uh, anxious, anxiously await your, your response on that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll sing this last song and then Ozzy will be coming up to uh, give us our closing comments and prayer. If you have any, uh, we need to meet with you real quick. Uh, my wife, Pat, uh, that pretty lady right over there in the black. Um, if you go see her uh, right over in this area, and we just have a quick meeting real uh, after her services. Good morning. We took us, this is our fifth Sunday. And I got a number here that was given to me. The day we took up $10,938 for our offering. So, so, you know, we as a congregation, it takes a group, a body to do the Lord's work. And I've been driving by this building for the last three months every day. I had a job out here, I finished it now, but uh, every day I come out here, I see a different person at this building. Somebody's up here working at this building, or somebody up here doing the Bible class at this building. You know, we was at a meeting Monday night, and I called a brother up here to check on something at the church. And he had an accident on the way up here to the church. He took his truck up. And he came back there and, you know, I could tell he was upset a little bit, but his spirit was there to serve the God. 
and I saw that. He knew who he is. He probably done told some of them that he did that to his truck. But I'm just telling y'all this here because uh, what Mike said this morning. We Christians today, will we be Christians tomorrow? Will we be Christians on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we come back here on Sunday and be Christians? This is the boat that we're in right here, this building. Will we get out of the boat and go make disciples this week? That's the question. This is the boat we're in this morning. Will we get out of this building and go make disciples? Jesus told us to go make disciples. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, coming to you once again. Thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to come and serve you. Thank you for the word was this morning. We thank you for this congregation, for all the love they have for one another. We just appreciate each and every one of them, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being you and sending your son down here for us that we too might have a chance for eternal life. That the Father, be with the ones that are sick in our congregation, be with the ones that come forward this morning, be with the ones that had the desire to come forward this morning and they just didn't come. Then the Father, be with the ones that are sick in the nursing homes, on the streets. Lord, they're all our brothers and sisters, Lord. Add a blessing to them. Then the Father, we go our separate ways today. Let's remember who we are. Let's take you with us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. We dismiss.